cogs, gears, call them what you will. But we're going to use this 3D printed part to fix this 3DO drive that won't load discs. And we're going to do it right now. This is a CD-ROM from a Japanese 3DO. The laser gets stuck in the middle of the drive and won't move. Let's strip this down so that I can show you the problem. First, removing the power and data cables from the drive. Next, let's remove this drive support. We don't need to take this out. We'll also take the disc clamp bar off. These screws can be tough to turn, so use the correct screwdriver. Remove this self-tapping screw. And pushing the retaining clip will remove the bar. With the clamping bar removed, I can describe the problem more easily. Flipping the beast over, we need to remove screws. There are four securing the logic board to the drive unit. Remove these and set them aside somewhere safe. The drive is not free yet and putting the unit the right way up means we can remove the five screws securing the drive to the metal chassis. These screws have a different thread to the screws you just removed, so make sure that you keep them separate to those four. With all that hard screwing out of the way, we can remove the drive from its bondage. Maneuver its internals gently out of the casing. We now have a better view of the internals of the drive. We need to be careful with these two thin ribbon cables to the drive head. Lift up the board gently so you can see how much range the cables have. There are five to unplug. Start with these two, they're the easiest. Next, paying attention to the rear, disconnect the plugged cable. This will then give us a bit more room to unplug the laser unit from the board. Do be extra careful with these thin cables. If you wanted to, now would be a good time to recap the board. Just be wary of these flat cables as you work. We can see the home position sensor switch and the laser head. Just to explain, the head travels up, hits the switch and the drive knows when it's ready to start seeking the disc's table of contents. When the drive powers on, it does a full seek up and down the gear to calibrate, but this one jams in the middle. It's never been able to travel back to the home position and start seeking the table of contents on the disc. When the laser head reaches the home position, the laser turns on and tries to focus on the disc. Then it moves slowly out, seeing if it can find the lead-in data. This process never even starts, so the load fails. I've manually pushed the laser head into this position to show you the home position. Well, at least we know where to start now. Inside here is a worm gear assembly. It's responsible for moving the laser head up and down this sled. Let's check it out. There's two screws and a locating pin for the gear housing.
Because these gears are meshed, it's best to lift the motor out from the rear. Here we have the primary worm and it looks okay. The motor turns okay too, but the fact it moved at all when powered on ruled the motor out. This is an adjustable position lock for the main bar. Looking at the worm gear, we can see an immediate clue to the problem. There's a massive crack in the gear. Because this is a compression fit gear, the tightness of the fit determines if it slips onto the spline shaft or not. Plastics inside these ancient systems can go brittle and will often split with age. This will be prone to slip when torque is applied, hence the jams. I've been provided several 3D printed candidates by my friend Neil, and I've narrowed it down to one gear with some caveats. This PLA gear fits the main worm perfectly. It's well formed and the print layers won't matter. But the hole is simply too big. The shaft doesn't even touch the sides. It's like a sausage in a bucket. But there is a solution. Epoxy resin with the housewife favourite Tommy Walsh. The shaft needs to come out, so let's pull it off. The other side of the laser assembly simply clips onto the opposing sled rail. The drive shaft turns really easily within the laser head assembly, so that's obviously not the problem. The gear comes off easily, which it shouldn't. These splines on the shaft are meant to prevent the gear from simply rotating freely. Unfortunately, this 3D printed gear is very loose on the shaft. The pink part is gaping. Hopefully, resin will fill that gap. So let's put this to one side. I like to use a post-it note for mixing resin. It stays still and protects the workbench. Getting even amounts of the two-part resin is the major part of the battle. Too little of either of the components and the glue simply won't set properly. Put the resin away now. Don't just put it on the desk without the lid or you'll end up with a sticky mess. Stir thoroughly until the mixture becomes gloopy. I want to get the glue right in the hole, not on the outside. With the adhesive in the gear, we're going to slide it onto the splines. If you get a blob on the end of your shaft, simply wipe it off with your finger. Keeping the gear as central as possible, we need to leave it to set. At this point, people might ask why I didn't just glue the original gear. Well, it's brittle and has half a tooth missing. Another reason is that even if we glued the old gear, the pressure of the shaft would just split it open again. When using epoxy resin, make sure to keep the mixing paper. It's a really good indicator of if the resin is setting properly. It's the next day and our resin has fully hardened. The gear seems really central as well. One potential problem I spot is that there's excess resin where the gear is mated to the shaft. I decide to remove the whole shaft and remove the excess. This is done by pulling back the gear teeth as shown. Scalpel please matron. Oh, sharp. As I gently whittle away the protruding resin, you can see just how hard it became during the night. 
I don't need to remove it all because there is a gap between the gear and the shaft holder. There, that's close enough. Let's do a quick test of the fit and function of our new creation. Right now I only want to slip the shaft into the mechanism to see how well it fits. With the residual lube on the shaft it can be quite hard to grasp it and slip in the tip. We're going to do a test with the motor engaged with the gear. I don't want to use lube yet because it could hide problems so we're going in dry. I'll hold the motor in place so I can feel if there's any mechanical issues. I certainly can't rotate the shaft anymore. I'm going to connect one of my bench power supplies to the motor and apply a gentle curve up to around 3 volts whilst keeping an eye on how much current the motor's drawing. Current draw is very low and the gear runs quite smoothly. With that test done, it's time for lube. This silicon grease is rated as plastic safe. Not all are, so check your tubes. With the grease installed, the printed gear is only moderately louder than the original gear to my ears. This looks really promising. Time to put the machine back together properly. I like to grease any parts or will be subject to any kind of movement. The blob on the end of the shaft will nicely lubricate the socket. Threading the laser assembly back on, then clipping the assembly onto the guide rail, we push the drive shaft into position. A little more lovely lube. And put the motor back into place. When you put these screws back into the case cover, don't over tighten because this can cause problems. Reconnect the five cables to the board and then reassembly is simply a matter of reversing the disassembly process. Putting the mechanism back into the metal casing. Next the CD clamping bar. These will fit either way around but not upside down. And finally, the front support bar. Pop the data and power ribbon cables in, and then it's time to test the mechanism when the drive tries its startup sequence. Hmm, let's see what happens if we pop in a disc. It sounds like the drive is seeking properly, so let's connect to the TV for a real test. Road Rash is one of my worst discs for loading on marginal systems. If anything is even slightly out it will either spit the disc out again, or the intro signals will be choppy as hell. So far so good. and that looks smooth as silk. The music is also playing without stuttering, but I can't show that on YouTube because they'll punish me. Next, let's try this unique collector's edition of Gex. I can play the audio on this FMV so you can see that that CDR works well too. It all started so simply. 
I had just finished my usual morning routine of nude funker size, fired up the Barca lounger, grabbed a quick bite to eat, and prepared to watch some serious tubes. Little did I know, my snack was sent by Rez. For my sins, I actually love Gex, and playing it on an NTSC system is better than the reduced screen size and lower gameplay speed of the PAL experience. Time to teach someone some manners. I'm really happy with this fix. Big thanks to Neil for the epic amount of work on the COG, and a massive thanks to my Patreon supporters on the screen right now. You make these videos possible. If you'd like to support future MFS videos, visit patreon.com forward slash markfixesstuff. Thanks so much for watching this video. Perhaps you'd like to watch another. Here you go. Here's some on the screen. Bye.